Welcome to Unpacking the Athlete Podcast, hosted by yours truly, Rob Martin. Welcome to Unpacking the Athlete, a podcast dedicated to diving deep into what makes athletes who they are. This is episode one, and today's guest is an avid mountain biker with a background in motocross. He has many accomplishments on the bike, including completing an Everesting on the bike. We may dig into that further. He races gravel and mountain bikes, and he and I love our adventure rides on fat bikes during the winter and mountain bikes during the summer. This guy has the best attitude and outlook even when the weather is crapping on us. He is the group motivator when things get tough. He's a friend of mine, and I'm happy to introduce to you Brent Lockhart, the guy you don't want to be behind when we hit the road on fat bikes. Your legs will get ripped off. Hey, Brent. Great to have you on. Hey, Rob. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. This is episode one. I'm real excited to uh, start this off and get the show rolling. Before you get ready to rip or have a crazy race, what song do you like to play or sing? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Um, so it used to be like I had a lot, a lot of different Metallica tunes in my playlist. Lately, because of you, it's uh, I Want to Rock. <laughs> I, I Want to Rock. <laughs> Yeah, man, the old school quiet ride. I want to rock, so I, nice. I I play that a lot now. <laughs> Thanks to you. Okay, <laughs> the next question is quite hilarious. Where is the biggest wiener you've ever seen? <laughs> Where? Yes. Oh gosh, where was that? <laughs> was that up in the UP? Yes, that was just just before the bridge. Just before the bridge. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They have the largest. They're the. It's the largest wiener in the world. Right. <laughs> Sitting right on top of the building. All right. Okay. Let's get serious. Let's start with Everesting. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what that is, and then tell us where it took place and the story behind it. Everesting is um, a hill repeat challenge. Basically, you pick a hill anywhere in the world, and you do repeats on that hill until you reach the overall elevation gain of Mount Everest, which is 29,029 feet. There's a, a very few rules to it other than it has to be consecutive on the same hill. You can't take advantage of rolling hills and uh, momentum and stuff like that. So it's straight up, straight down one hill. I mean, you can't sleep. You can take as long as you want to do it, but you can't sleep. We chose Maiden's Road Climb, which is uh, M22 out of Onekama, Portage Lake. So from the bottom of the hill to the top was, I think it was a, a approximately, it was like a mile and a quarter, I think, wasn't it? Yep. Mile and a quarter and about 345 to 350 elevation gain each rep. Somewhere in there. Yep. And we had figured out we had to do 86 reps, I think it was. If, <laughs> is that correct? Yes, I think it was right there. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah. There's no way I'll ever forget that. It was 86 reps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, do you want me to go through the whole our whole experience with this Everesting, or just talk about what it is? I'd like you just to give me a brief story on what happened that day. Short, short version. Yep, short version of how it went, who was there, and the, the story behind it. My story is, is not, it's not a short version. <laughs> That's okay. I'll, I guess I'll get into talk about how it all even came about, right? Yep. How we, how we even came upon Everesting because I, I didn't know it even existed, right? During COVID, a few of us, myself, you, and a couple other buddies, we all were still wanting to ride, still wanting to train during COVID when everything was shut down. And although, yeah, we, 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 uh, social distance and, you know, wore a mask and all that stuff that you were supposed to do, but we still rode together and we were doing all these crazy long rides and we were tr trying to one up the previous ride, every ride we did. And next thing you know, it 
rolled into this thing where I think it was you, Rob, that came up with this crazy idea of doing this Everesting that you heard had heard about some of the pros were doing because all these guys all over the country and all over the world are still training, still riding, but they have no race to, they have no, nowhere to, to test what they're, what they're doing to test their skill. And so, so they, people started Everesting and you heard about it, let us know about it. And we're like, you know, I think at first we were kind of like, yeah, you know, there's no way. I think up until that point, we, we hadn't even did a 10,000 foot climbing ride yet. So to think <laughs> about doing almost 30,000 was just kind of crazy. It was almost laughable, right? Like we, exactly. yeah, we talked about it and we're like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll do it. <laughs> but the more we talked about it and the more harder rides we did and built up to it, we kind of realized, okay, may, maybe this is something that we could do. And there was no races on the horizon and COVID, we kept getting more deep into COVID and we didn't know when there was going to be another event. Finally, yeah, we decided we were going to do this. You know, I had met a cyclist from Indiana that was uh, Jason Potsander that was battling pancreatic cancer. And I didn't know him well, but I knew him well enough to know his story and knew that he was, you know, battling through some, some bad stuff. And he was an avid cyclist and just someone that I thought that we could maybe try and help through doing this Everesting, like make it <clears throat> more than just about doing an event to test our our training, but maybe try and raise some money or raise some exposure for Jason's GoFundMe page in the process of doing this. Yeah, we all, all of us agreed that that would be something great to do for Jason. And so I contacted Jason about it. He was super pumped about us doing this for him. And he was so grateful. And he contacted me back a few minutes later and said, Hey, do you mind if I crash your party and do this with you guys? Attempt <laughs> this Everesting with you. And I said, absolutely. We would love to have you. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you know, this is a, a totally unsupported event. And I ended up contacting Jason later and let him know, you know, we don't, we don't have any medical staff or anything for all the what ifs that can happen just so he knew fully what he might be getting into. And, and he did, he had already, you know, I contacted him 10 minutes later and he said, Oh yeah, I've already talked to my wife about it. I've already, I'm already working on plans. So he was, he was already all in, which I thought was awesome. So, and we all talked about it and yeah, we were, we were happy to have him. Yeah. We started out bottom of this hill, M22, Portage Lake, you know, Nekama five in the morning in the fog, we could hardly see the road in front of our face. And we started going up, up and down this hill, man, making, making repeats, counting them down. We knew we had to do 86, <laughs> one at a time. We had a, a little bit faster pace going than Jason. I mean, obviously he's a super strong cyclist, but he's going th through chemo, battling cancer and all the, you know, all the pain and all the bad shit that goes along with cancer. He's dealing with all that. You know, we are, we're, we're, we're all in the shape of our lives, not battling any type of physical issues and he's battling all the physical issues. So uh, we, we had all agreed to, to just go, you know, kind of at our own pace. We're going to have different bathroom breaks, different food breaks, stuff like that. So we would just pass each other up and down the hill. And so that's what we did. We, we uh, continued on and, you know, as we're kind of going at a little bit faster pace, as we're coming down the hill, Jason's going up and vice versa. And we're all shouting encouragement to each other and about, I don't know, a midday at some point, the sun was directly overhead and it was, a, it was a, it was a warm day, like 80 degree day, but you know, we thought we had this thing all figured out, um, almost like a math problem. Like we just had to go this speed at this many reps and you know, we're going to be done in 14 to 17 hours, worst case scenario. Heat of the day came out. We did not anticipate the sun and the heat that that creates. I looked down at my Garmin at one point and you know the Garmin Garmin gives you a little bit closer to the actual tarmac temp, so that sun hitting the black black top and reflecting back. You know I had over 100 degrees for most of the day on my Garmin, and that took its toll. Started taking its toll on us bad, real heavily. And fortunately, Rob, your wife was there and and really saved us. It was really uh, amazing what she did. She knew what we needed before we even needed it. She had right. um, ice cold towels you know, fresh water bottles, all this stuff. Just, it was like, she was like a one person full SAG support team for four guys. It was crazy what she was doing. Yeah. Much appreciated. And that saved us, saved all of us for quite a while, but the heat really took its toll. And as we're 
really struggling to figure out what the hell we're still doing out here. And the pain's really setting in. Jason is now starting to shout motivation at us and he's, he's smiling ear to ear. <laughs> and I remember talking about that with, with you and the other guys, like this guy's amazing, unbelievable. Just the attitude that he has in is amidst all the pain, still pushing through and finding a way to enjoy himself. Sorry, man. I get a little bit emotional just talking about no, I, experience. I was too. When you said that I, I am too. It's just a, a crazy crazy experience to watch someone I because I know how hard it was for all of us oh yeah um, that had no physical attributes to ne- deal with negatively going in you know we were all 100 percent, and this guy's not you know he's at this point he's maybe 50 percent. I'm guessing I don't know I never really asked him that question but he's going through a lot of bad shit a lot of pain yep we get into this thing 10, 12, 14, 16 hours and it's taken its toll and I'm, 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 I'm about done. And I know the other guys that were with us, they were forced, forced to tap out. And I, I was ready to tap out as well. It was just, it was horrible. I got a little lucky that I wasn't dealing with stuff quite to the extent that you guys were. The heat didn't get to me quite as bad. I can only attribute that to just, I guess, luck or the grace of God, I guess, somehow kept kept me in that thing because it, it, was, it was super tough. But I had promised Jason at one point throughout the day, I had promised him that we were, you know, we were talking a little bit about it and he was concerned about not being able to keep up, keep our pace, Yep. which, which we soon realized that we couldn't even <laughs> keep our pace, right? We had right. this thing calculated way wrong, way more difficult than what we ever anticipated it being. I had told him, don't, don't worry about your pace. This is not about how fast, how fast you go. It's just about getting to the finish line, right? It's just about completing it. He's like, okay. And I, and I told him, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll go as long as you want to go is what I told him. If I'm being honest in the back of my mind, I'm hoping that he doesn't plan on completing this. Right. Right. Because I, I don't want to, at this point, we get about 17 hours in which is our worst case scenario, slow, you know, the, the point at which we thought it, there's no way it's going to take us longer than that. I'm like, man, I hope that Jason's ready to call it because, because I am. So I asked him, how are you doing? And he said, okay, you know, I'm, I'm doing okay. Just plugging along, you know? And I had asked him this throughout the course of the day, several times, you know, every couple hours I would ask him and he he replied just the same exact way with a smile every time you know just plugging along I'm doing all right you know at that point you know having asked him this throughout the day in 17 hours in he's still saying that smiling (laughs) I'm like right then I knew this this guy he's completing this he's going to complete this there's nothing that's going to stop this guy he's just he refuses to quit just refuses at all costs. So like, all right, I guess I'm doing this thing with him. And so that's when I, I settled in to Jason's pace at that point and just rode, rode with him. And I'm very glad that I did. I'm, I'm very glad that I, I settled into that pace because there's no way, no way possible. I could have kept the pace that we were, that we were trying to go. It just wasn't going to happen on that day. And I, I learned a lot about Jason that day and, and his, his grit, his toughness, his heart, the guy's just a warrior. He's an inspiration to me. I know to a lot of other people just completing some of the stuff that he, he is able to do like this Everesting attempt. Like he, he knowing what I know about him fully got me through that event. Sorry. I, I, told you I'd give you the short version, but it's, it's hard for me to give a short version of that experience. Yeah. It's good. It's, it's all good. It's, it's something that's just, it's burned into me, man. It's like burned into my soul. It's like, good, man. Like not many other experiences. So to date, so I, I thank you for coming up with that idea and all the logistics around help me, you know, figure out how to do this and the other guys for being willing to do it with us and, and for uh, Jason for pushing us all to do this. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, to date, 
It's my longest ride to date by far. I think we did, Jason and I did a couple extra reps just to make sure that it was official and the Garmin captured everything so that it could be official in the Everesting books. Because, yeah, there's uh, uh, some guys from Australia that manage this whole website and record book and stuff, which is which is pretty cool in itself. 242 miles, just over 30,000 feet of climbing, and about 20 hours. It was just over, just over 20 hours elapsed time. Um, I think it was about 18 hours ride time. That's my short version of Everesting. <laughs> and you know what? It's still my longest ride to date as well. Because I think I hit 210 miles, maybe. Yep. Yep. So that <laughs> it's, that it's, was quite quite the day. I I will have to. Uh, it's burned in my memory as well. I'll yeah. never forget that. Yep. Well, I appreciate that story. We're gonna switch courses now, and I'm going to get into you a little more, and ask you when did you get started on the mountain bike, or how did that happen. Sure. Probably it was, I think, 2014. So as you know, I came from a a motocross background. So when I I had always rode when I was young, never raced, never raced until I was like 17-ish years old, but always rode, always enjoyed it. And then got into motocross heavy, you know, 17 through, I don't know, 23, 24, had some bad injuries and started having kids and, um, you know, had a family to raise. So started transitioning out of that. And, but I always enjoyed being involved in some kind of, you know, physical activity, took up golf for a little while after moto, um, (laughs) enjoy that, but wasn't physical enough for me. So I got into running a little bit and old motocross injuries, you know, bad knees and stuff like that started to pop up. So wasn't running a whole lot anymore. Uh, One of my old moto buddies, a couple, a couple of those guys actually were riding together like once a week, every day they'd go out and ride like Merrill and Luton and Rockford area, a lot of cool trails around that area, Cannonsburg. So they'd pick a different trail every week and go out and ride. So they convinced me to go with them. And I had a old entry level Trek 26er rim brakes, 40 pound bike. And I thought, yeah, I'll go. And man, that's for the first time I was hooked. Had a blast. Nice. Absolute blast. Had an absolute riot. Yeah. So that started me into mountain biking. And then there's a whole long story of the rabbit hole of, you know, that every <laughs> mountain biker goes down of, you know, upgrading bikes and parts, the endless, endless battle of the, you know, the N plus one, right? Right. <laughs> It never stops. Never stops. <laughs> you always need a, a better bike or more latest and greatest parts. So, <laughs> right. Do you think motocross translated into some of your skills on the mountain bike? For sure. Yep. Yeah. A, a lot. Yeah. Moto skills help helped a ton, especially with a lot of the faster or sandier type terrain. Yeah. Um, maybe not so much with the slow speed balance stuff but definitely with the with the maybe not so much with the what um like the like slower not so much with the slow speed balancing part of biking like maybe technical rocky rudy stuff maybe it it might not have helped as much with that although i'm I'm sure it did i mean you have to have pretty good balance and stuff on on a motocross bike on a motocross track or a supercross track you're going fast and obstacles are coming at you fast. So you have to be able to take everything in and process it and figure out your line and everything really fast without thinking about it. It sounds counterintuitive, but you have to be able to think about this stuff or react to this stuff without thinking about it. So it has to be second nature for things coming at you fast. So I think where it's helped me out most is on fast parts of the trail or descents Or, you know, when you're going down a hill and there's a sand pit at the bottom of the hill or a corner at the bottom of the hill, or, you know, you got to split a couple trees through the woods. I'm more comfortable with things coming at me fast, I guess. So the higher speeds uh, definitely, definitely helped with that a ton. And, and like I said, the, the balance aspect of it. Oh, heck yeah. Other than the Everesting, 
what other recent event was very challenging for you, but yet fun at the same time? So I recently did the Kranza 170 gravel adventure on Fat Adventure? Bike. Yeah, it was an adventure. <laughs> you want me to elaborate on that? Yeah, give it, give us a little bit of a, a story on that. Okay. Good riding buddy of mine and I did this Kranza 170 race. It was Kranza gravel adventure. Decided to do it on fat bikes and went into this thing with, you know, on, on the way there, we're kind of talking, you know, on, on what our expectations are for this race or what's our goal for this race. You know, do we just want to ride it? Do we want to race it? What do we want to try to do? And we decided we were, <laughs> we were going to try and hang with the lead group as long as we could. Right. <laughs> right. Hang with the lead group guys on gravel bikes. We're going to try and hang with them. For as long as we can bikes. on fat tire bikes in a 170 mile race. Obviously, we were full of ourselves and feeling really good. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we managed to do that for 80 miles. Um, it was a lot of fun, too. We were trading poles with the lead guys, which in hindsight, we, should, we shouldn't have. That was, shouldn't that's have pretty been, badass, though. <laughs> we shouldn't have been trading poles with gravel guys on fat tire bikes. <laughs> right. And we shouldn't have been trying to hang with them to begin with, you know, <laughs> because... It was fun doing that for 80 miles, but at about almost the 80 mile point on the mark, we had been averaging 19 miles an hour. Um, <laughs> there were a lot of hills and a lot of sand and stuff too, mud pits, all this other stuff. So while we're, you know, on the good gravel roads, we're, you know, maintaining 22 to 24 miles an hour on fat bike, which as you know, we've done a lot of fat, fat bike races together. Yep. It's hard to do that for very long. Yep. Yeah, so at eight miles in, man, we were both done, cashed out. Fun was over. It was now we're in Fun was so over. We got ninety <laughs> miles to go. <laughs> right. Yeah, so we get we get uh, to about the hundred mile mark, and here comes Roy Kranz, who is the guy that puts on this whole event. Thanks for putting that on, by the way, Roy. I wasn't saying such nice things about you during the event, but <laughs> you're a good guy. <laughs> May have been some cuss words there. Oh, he put together one hell of a course, man. One hell of a course. It was very, very challenging. So he, anyway, he, he is going around kind of providing SAG to people, SAG support, you know, people at a different points, you know, Hey, you need a Coke, you need a water, eat some ice. What can I do to help you keep going? So we got a Coke and a couple waters from them and cannonball those and kept on moving, man. And that helped, that helped a ton, but we didn't, we didn't fuel enough. We didn't fuel with the right kind of fuel. So we ended up stopping at a couple gas stations along the way. Um, just cause again, the, the sun came out and ended up being really hot. We didn't anticipate the heat. So we're cooling off in the shade at the gas stations, dumping water on our heads, trying to drink or eat whatever we could stomach. For me, when I'm really bonky or done, the little eight ounce Red Bulls work good for me. I cannonball one of those and it kind of woke me back up a little bit. <laughs> Got your wings. Yeah, I got my wings back, man, at least for a little <laughs> while. Like I said, the last the last 90 miles were tough. And then you go through some decent pavement and good gravel areas, and you you start to think, okay, all right, you know, we got 40, 50 miles to go. It's, you know, we're smooth sailing now. And this is when your, your special words for Roy come out. Um, <laughs> but the last 40 miles of this race is some of the worst hills in the whole course some of the toughest, toughest hills. We, we start getting to some of these hills and we're just, we're so spent from trying to keep up with the lead group earlier in the race that, and we're done. And I, I'll tell you, man, I, I, re, <laughs> I remember the Everesting vividly and I wanted to quit this race worse than I did the Everesting. Huh. I had foot cramping going on that I don't know where it came from, all kinds of stuff going on. Yeah, my, my buddy, he completely bonked as well. I mean, both of us did. So we're just, we're trying to motivate each other and we're kind of going in, in waves. Like I'm done and he's helping me, you know, pulling me along and trying to motivate me. And then he's done. And then I'm, I somehow find a, a 17th wind and am, you know, pulling him along. So we're kind of going back and forth doing this the last last uh, half of the race. If there would have been an easy out, we probably would have took it on this one, but there wasn't. We were out in the middle of nowhere. I don't even know where the heck we were. Out in the middle of nowhere, there was 
there was like no cell signal. No, there was, there was nothing we could do. We just had to keep following our Garmin, hoping that it was going to lead us to the finish line eventually <laughs> back to the truck. But it was, it got so bad a couple times. There were a couple hills that we literally got off our bikes and walked up these hills because we just, we didn't want to turn the cranks anymore. It was hard to turn the cranks anymore. And the, I mean, these were hills, they were big hills, but they were hills that normally, you know, we'd screw around and ride wheelies up them, you know? Right. Short version, we ended up finishing, yep, finished under 12 hours, which was, I guess, pretty good on a fat tire bike. I mean, we ended up fourth and fifth overall. It was a, another cool. another good and bad day on the bike. <laughs> but what I'm learning with these with any of these endurance events is you have to take the bad with the good and the bad is actually part of the good. So you learn a lot about yourself during these events too. And I think that's maybe part of what attracts me to these events is that it's, it's, it ends up being more about just a bike ride. It ends up being a little bit about survival too, which I think is, is pretty cool. I would personally say that fourth and fifth overall on fat bikes is pretty damn good. Thanks. (laughs) Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and you told that story so well, I think I got a little nauseated at with 40 miles to go. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was <laughs> tough. I, I guess I, sh- I need to add something else that's pretty interesting about this whole story. When we're done with the race, one of Roy's guys comes up and gives you a, a nice finisher's badge, you know, and he gives a finisher's badge to us and we get in the truck and Rob throws a finisher's badge over at me and he says, I don't want this. He says, I don't ever want to see that thing again. <laughs> I said, okay, all right, that's fine. I said, you'll change your mind in a couple of days. I said, we'll do this again next year. He says, he says, flat out, no fucking way am I ever doing this race again. You'll never talk me into it. I said, okay, so we, we're driving home and I'm hungry. I'm, I'm starving. And I know yeah. he is too, because he's trying to eat an oatmeal cream pie, but he falls asleep while he's eating it. it I saw the picture. Him. I took a picture of them, sent it to all yes. you guys. <laughs> so, so we stop at uh, Culver's, order some burgers, get back on the road, eating as we're driving, and he unwraps his burger. It takes him like 10 minutes to get his burger unwrapped. I've already got mine gone by the time he's even got his unwrapped. He takes a bite, wraps it back up, throws it in the bag, and lays back and takes a deep breath. And I said, you not hungry? And he goes, uh, yeah, I'm hungry. He goes, I'm just taking a break. <laughs> <laughs> we were we were that tired like it was it was a chore just trying to eat something like, i believe it he was so smoked he couldn't eat his hamburger <laughs> <laughs> taking a break yeah so yeah taking a break eating, eating my hamburger i'm getting tired he goes home you know in hindsight i probably should have dropped him off at home and then went and got his car and brought his car back to him but he's like no i'm fine to drive i had some sugar. I'm good now. So he drove home. And so the, the next day, um, when I knew he wasn't home, I brought that finisher's badge over to his <laughs> house and I put it in his RV where I know that he would see it. Cause he was going to be getting his RV ready for a camping trip the next day. So I put that on the front seat of his RV. I didn't hear from him. You said, yeah. You the, still the, have it. No. Well, I didn't hear from him for a couple days after that. So okay. I put that finisher's badge in his in his seat. Didn't hear from him for a couple of days after that, and then uh, he finally texted me back and uh, let me know that he was ready for Kranza again next year. So <laughs> it didn't take a whole lot of convincing to get him ready for it again. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Fun so and next challenging. year, buddy. You know we need some company. We need some more company next year. <laughs> so get ready. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking to you. <laughs> Don't look behind you. <laughs> There's no one else here. <laughs> Fun and challenging, right? Very. Okay. What was moving on? We're gonna we're gonna go to what was the best investment you made in yourself, or maybe a parent made in you that helped you along the way to make you who you are today. Could be for my son right now. We're dishing out quite a bit of money for camps and private training for basketball, right? Something like that. Sure. For me, I think it was more just a, a work ethic. I think that was taught to me at a young age, just the whole, the whole concept of working towards something, working for something. And, 
you know, not being afraid to put in hard work for something and, and uh, not always expecting the greatest results from things. Like I remember learning, you know, at a young age, sometimes it's, it, it's okay not to 100% meet your goal, just working toward that goal and putting the work to get there or to even get close to it is sometimes can be enough. I agree with that. Did you look up to anyone in motocross, did, like any of the superstars or elite riders? Did you ever look up to anyone there? And and also, did you did you have anyone in the mountain biking elite realm that you looked up to? Oh yeah, yep, yep. So in in moto, looked up to all the, I mean all the, all the big guys, all the goats, you know, the greatest of all times, you know, Jeremy McGrath, Jeff Emig, Ricky Carmichael when he came around. I mean. He was more, he was a, he was a kid when I was, you know, <laughs> racing a lot, but, um, he was still just, I think he was just kind of coming into the 125 ranks when I was getting out of it, looked up to all those guys. And then a, a lot of the, you know, local, uh, Michigan guys that you would see at races too, that were formerly on, on the big stage like that, you know, guys like Jeff Stanton, Todd Hoop, John Gruy, we'd see these guys sometimes at the, at the local tracks, they were good, uh, good, good role models for people like me that wanted to try to get to that level someday, you know, they had been there. Yeah. And kind of looked up to those guys in moto in mountain biking. I'll be honest with you, Rob. I don't, I don't follow cycling. Like I did motocross, like motocross. I could tell you every rider, every racer, but in, in cycling, I, I don't follow the, the pros like I did in moto. Of course, I'm just kind of starting to get into cycling more now yeah. that now that my, my, my kids are kind of grown and doing their own thing now. So I'm putting more time into it, learning more about it. I've only been doing this, I think, about, I think, riding total like seven years, six, seven years and racing like five years or something like that. So I think I'm, I'm just starting to scratch the surface on stuff. When I got into it, people that I looked up to racing were guys like, you and Josh for Hayes, to be honest with you, like you guys were in our area, were some of the fastest guys around that I knew at the local track, you know, at yep. that time I'm riding Owasapi, the local trail and not racing yet, but just on Strava, you know, racing Strava, right? Yeah. You know, looking at Strava times and like, man, who's this, who's this Rob Martin guy? Who's this Josh for Hayes guy? Like these guys, <laughs> these guys haul ass, you know, like. <laughs> Yeah, I was just kind of looking up to you guys a little bit. Didn't even really know you yet. Kind of tracking your times out there and trying to match your times out there. And then I had I had run into you one time out at uh, Bass River. I don't know if you even yep. remember this. Yes, I do. So I'm I'm brand new into mountain biking. You know, just have an entry level bike, and I see this dude getting out of his car that's like full, you know, kitted up, sweet bike. Dude's getting out there, ready to rip. Looks look like looks like he's a, a pro rider, you know. And here I am. I think I got baggy shorts and you know just t-shirt and flat pedals and tennis shoes. So I didn't know the trail. Like didn't never been out there before. Just googled it and went out there. And so I had I had walked up, approached you, and I'm like, hey man, you know this trail very well. You mind if I, you know, follow you around and so I don't get lost and stuff. And you were very down to earth, very cool about it. Like not arrogant or anything. You're just like, yeah, man, no problem. Let's go check this out. I didn't know it's like one of the easiest trails in the area to follow. I mean, you're probably thinking, who is this guy? You can't get lost on this trail. Like there's no <laughs> connectors. There's no nothing. You just follow the trail. I didn't know. You didn't, you didn't uh, feel the need to tell me that. You're just like, Hey man, yeah, let's, let's go cruise. And that's what we did. And we went out there and cruised and you didn't like, try to, you know, show off, show, you know, do backflips or any of this other stuff to try and show me how cool you were. You just, we just, you were just making conversation and we were just talking. I'm like, man, that, that dude's cool. I'd like to ride with that guy some more. So yeah. Yeah. So yeah, man, you're, you're one of good the to ride I up to when I got into it. Nice. Well, I appreciate that. And it was, it was a good ride and I even showed you how to crash off a route. Uh, you did. You didn't show me how to do a backflip. You showed me how to do a proper front flip though. Right. <laughs> you were like, are you okay? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. 
Oh, that was kind of funny. Yeah, that was the first experience, wasn't it? Yep. If you're thinking back and you can pick motocross or mountain biking, I would probably take motocross first because it was more of a first time thing. Walk us through your first motocross race and maybe the nerves and how you prepared for that. Oh boy. Yeah. If you can. <laughs> that was a long time ago. So that was, I think, 94. I rode a lot, rode moto, never raced until I was 17, maybe even 18 years old. So. 94 it was actually the pontiac silverdome in the so on the back then they would i don't know if they still do but back then they would do the all the pros on saturday and saturday night and then all the amateur races would be on sunday a friend of mine at the time still a friend today but friend i rode with then talked me into doing this pontiac silverdome race and this was going to be my first race in like the novice beginner level novice class right 250 yep. c 250 c class and you're riding on the same track as the pros ride on so you watch the pros you know race on saturday and you're watching them and they make they make it look so easy <laughs> so easy so effortless you're thinking man i, I could do that i do that on my home track you know right. I do that. so to prepare for that i didn't even know how to prepare for that man i was so nervous so amped up about this that I was just, I was beside myself that I was racing my first race in an indoor stadium. It just seemed, it seemed crazy to me. And it was crazy looking back because I don't, do you want me to take you through the race at all and how it went? Yeah. Okay. You get up to the gate, man. And it's like, you look around and you're in the stadium. I mean, there's, there's really nobody in the stands on amateur day, but you're in, you're on the same track as, you know, Jeremy Grath was just on. Right. So you have all these notions that you're going to be able to jump some of the stuff he was jumping or, you know, try and go fast. So I'm just all nerved up, man. And the gate drops and I'm full throttle and just dump the clutch. And I flip that bike right over backwards, right off, oh. right off the start. Really? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so I gather, my, gather myself back up, get out on the track and very quickly realize that there's a very good reason why those guys make big dollars doing right. what they do because that track is like TV doesn't even do, do it justice. How gnarly these tracks are. Like you don't realize there's knee deep ruts everywhere. So it's not like riding a flat surface. There's ruts everywhere and you're pinned in that rut. So if you're not comfortable and your balance isn't there or you're a novice rider, like I was at the time, you can barely ride around the track, let alone jump much of anything. So, <laughs> uh, it, was, it was a very humbling experience, my first motocross race. I I can't imagine. I, <laughs> it's just like anything, right? When you look at even mountain biking on TV and you're looking at a jump that they're doing or a rock roll that they're doing and it's like, oh, I can do that. And then you get there and it's like, how the heck did they do this? This is huge. Yes. Yep. Right. Yep. yep absolutely. Yeah. TV, TV video makes things look a lot easier than what they really are. <laughs> yeah. Sort of. I mean, to, to prepare for that, I'll be honest with you. It, it all came about so fast at, at the novice level where I was at that time, there wasn't a lot of thought and preparation that went into performing. It was just kind of doing it at the time for the experience, but it was a good experience. I mean, later on, as I progressed in the sport, it turned into a turned a little more serious, and yeah. a little bit more of, you know, training and thinking things out a little bit more. Thinking of currently, how many hours a week, if you record that, do you spend during base building season on the bike on average? I'd say for me, as you know, I don't really train like I should. <laughs> if I would follow follow your instruction, I would do much, much better. I wing wing it a lot. Yeah. And so I, I pretty much average right around seven, eight hours a week, regardless of what phase 
I'm yep. in. I mean, I'm in, unless I'm taking a race super serious, like I haven't done very often, I'm pretty much year round seven to eight hours. So whether it be, I, I, I mean, if, if, if I'm doing more base building, then yeah, it's just more, you know, lower intensity stuff, but that same duration throughout the week, you know, that eight hour unless average. We're, unless we're doing adventure rides. Yeah. Unless we're doing adventure rides and then we'll get up there, you know, 14, 15 hours or even more, who knows? <laughs> yeah. So for, for base building, yeah, I'd say it's probably seven to eight hours a week. Okay. Who has been your biggest competition racing mountain bikes along the way? And then tell us some of the times where you went head to head. Okay. So my biggest competition is also my closest riding buddy. And that's Rob Richardson. He's one of the guys that I started getting into mountain biking with riding out at Waspie Scout Camp all the time, which we still do today. And he's also been some of my uh, biggest competition. When we, when we first started out in the sport class, we'd go back and forth. You know, he'd win a race, I'd win a race. Until one race, we started out and we would, we would, trade, we would trade poles on the front. So I'd pull a lap and then he'd pull a lap. And then, you know, if it was a three lap race, the last lap gloves would come off and then we'd <laughs> race each other, you know, and the one race we did, it came down to a sprint finish for both of us. I think it was the, the state games championship race for winter rush fat bike series this year. Oh. And so we'd went back and forth the whole series and we're like tied in points. So it came down to this last race. And man, we were both just getting after it. The last lap, it was like, you know, we're, 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 we were so competitive with each other. We were almost taking each other's wheels out in the corners and stuff, you know, both of us wanted, <laughs> wanted, wanted this so bad. Right. right. Came down to the last sprint and I out sprinted him and, uh, took, took the, took the series. I don't think, I've ever been able to hold his wheel since. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's been, it's been, it's great, great friendly competition. And I, and Absolutely. I, and I love it. I, I love that I can race with my friends and have good friendly competition like that. Cause I think we, we all push each other to be better. Yep. But yeah, that's yeah. In, in a, in a nutshell, yeah, my my uh, best riding buddy is also my biggest competition. That's think, awesome, isn't and it? I think he'd probably say the same. Well, maybe not too much anymore, but at one time I was, I was good competition for him. Maybe <laughs> in a put us in a hundred and seventy mile race, and I might be competition for him. But you know, <laughs> under, under five hours, he's gonna he's gonna ride away from me. Maybe that that race gave him the motivation to train a little harder. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. He's like, man, there ain't no way I'm letting Brent out sprint me again. <laughs> right. Why do you love the sport and what keeps you going in mountain biking? I guess part of what, what, what we just touched on a little bit, you know, the, the camaraderie, the people, but also the competition. I enjoy training. I enjoy testing your training, even though I, I don't necessarily take training sometimes as serious as I should. I try to have a lot of fun with it too. And so if, if there's a fun ride that comes up during a training phase where I shouldn't be doing that long of a ride, nine times out of 10, I'm going to pick the fun <laughs> ride because I, yep. I, I enjoy racing. I enjoy doing a lot of fun rides more, to be honest with you. Absolutely. I'm tending to agree the, the older I get that riding with the guys and having fun is more fun than the prep and the racing. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you. Some of the rides that we do are going to prepare you for whatever a race is going to throw at you anyway. <laughs> I agree with that a hundred percent. Yeah. I think, I think what becomes more important, the older we get is for me anyway, is learning how to taper for races. So yeah. learning when to, when, when do I need to back off of these tough rides? Cause we're putting in the work. We're still putting in the work. It might not be structured, which isn't ideal, but we're still putting in the work. Yep. Um, and so it just comes down to, you know, not doing a 
right before Arcadia race. I mean, the week before Arcadia, we do a 170 mile Kranza gravel race. You know, right. If, if you want to perform at your top level, you probably shouldn't be doing a 170 mile, 12 hour event a week before a cross country mountain bike race. That's going to require you to be in zone five for an hour and a half, you know? No. Nope. So yeah, you're right. Stuff like <laughs> that is, but like I say, I, I know that going in, I know it's not a smart choice, but <laughs> I'm not necessarily trying to be smart about it. I'm trying to have fun. Yep. You love the sport because it is fun. And yep. it, it's definitely a fun time. Yep. Do you incorporate strength training into your training? Do you lift weights? Yes, I do. Um, in the off season, in the, in the winter, I'll lift a little bit. Not super consistent with it, but I, I try to at least one day a week work on like heavier weight barbell squats, uh, dumbbell, you know, lighter weight dumbbell lunges, stuff like that. A little bit of side lunges for like side mobility strength, stuff like that. But, okay. Yeah. And then so more of the winter base building off season and then during summertime and more riding, you kind of lay off them? Yep. Okay. What is your favorite interval workout to do on the bike? Do you prefer shorter intervals or longer intervals? I like easy intervals, so the shorter <laughs> ones. <laughs> you said easy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Easy intervals. I like those. Um, no, yeah, probably. Yeah, the, like, <laughs> I know I'm not your, I'm not your, your, uh, <laughs> I'm not your best athlete here, Rob. I'm, I'm more the, you know, the guy that should probably lay off the donuts and beer a little bit more. <laughs> but no, I, I do take intervals seriously sometimes. And I like doing short and sweet intervals, man, like 30, thirties, you know, 30 seconds on 30 seconds off, you know, 30 seconds all out and 30 seconds off. And eventually those start to add up. But I've also learned from your programs too, what you get more, more from as far as I guess, more practical, actual usable power is from doing over unders. So I'll do, I, I will do some extended over under, um, intervals too. I like, I don't like doing those. They suck, <laughs> but I know the results that you get from them. So I will do them. Yep. I'm going to agree. <laughs> I do like the shorter ones myself. One minute or less yep. for intervals, yep. you know, with the same or less of a rest period. That's, that's kind of what I prefer as well. I'm going to agree with you on that. <laughs> you know, if there was one race you could do over, which race would that have been? And what would you have done differently? One race that I'd like to do over would be a Yankee Springs time trial last fall. So not, not this Springs late race, but last fall's race. 2021. Um, yep. The 2021 fall race. Usually going into the Yankee race, it's early in the spring and sometimes the weather is a little bit cooler and I'm usually dealing with spring allergies and all this other stuff and my asthma and everything's always messed up for me in the spring. So I don't, I don't really kind of come into my physical peak as far as my lung function until, you know, late summer, early fall, I really start feeling good and being able to breathe and feeling like I can push through things more as far as far as you know doing zone four or five stuff last fall yankee was was deferred to the fall because of covid numbers in the spring they didn't have it in the, their usual spring so they had it in the fall so going into this race i didn't realize how good my fitness was at that time and i'm not saying that trying to be cocky or arrogant or anything like that i just honestly didn't know where my fitness was. And when I got on the trail, I signed up late. Like I didn't even know if I was going to race it. I signed up late. So I started way back in, you know, usually within five to 10 minutes of a race, I can kind of tell how it's going to go as far as my lung function. And this race, I could just keep putting power on the pedals and I would breathe harder and my heart rate would go up, but I could keep putting power on the pedals. And next thing I know, I'm just catching people left and right, just passing people like crazy. And I'm like, wow, man, this, 
feels really good. But not realizing how far I can push it and didn't want to push myself over the edge and, and you know, burn too many matches and, and potentially bonk and just sitting behind riders and not really not being aggressive enough. So in a time trial and single track, if you want to get your best time, you have to be very vocal about your coming through, you know, and, and asking, you know, try to be polite about passing, but at the same time, you have to have a little bit of aggressiveness to be able to get around people quick or for people to move out of the way quick. And I wasn't doing that. I was just kind of sitting in and, you know, waiting for someone to look back and say, Hey, you want by? And so I just kind of did that the, the whole race and, didn't really look down to see where I was at, what time I was at. And when I got done with the race, I had run my fastest two laps that I've ever run out there. And I, I feel like, I feel like I left a lot out there because I wasn't aggressive enough yep. beca- because I didn't realize I didn't have a pulse on where my fitness was. Mm-hmm. And that was 100% my fault. I'm, I'm not blaming what I left out there on other riders what happened is on totally on me. I didn't have a pulse on where I was. So fit, fitness wise, so I wasn't being aggressive. And I, and I think in hindsight, that's one of the few times that I can remember where everything showed up on race day, except for my racing mind, my racing <laughs> mind didn't show up. I was just, honestly, I was out there cruising. Yeah. Just cruising around. And I set my fastest lap. So I think if I would have been a little bit more aggressive, I could have done even, even better. So yeah, yeah, that's I, one that stands out to me that I, I feel like I, I left a lot out there. You know, I, I don't know if I'll be able to duplicate that ever again. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting older, <laughs> yep. but I can attest, and this isn't tooting your horn or making you, you know, whatever. Last fall, you were in amazing mountain bike fitness. I mean, your, your form was, was amazing last fall. You were fast, you were strong, you could crush everybody up hills. It was really cool to watch on some of the rides we were on. Yeah. I, that. I just, yeah, I didn't even, didn't really even realize it. Like I said, that's, you know, partly my fault for not, it is my fault for not keeping a pulse on where I was were. with my training. And that's where, yeah. you know, guys like yourself that are, more in tune with where your body's at, where all the metrics are at, what's going on with your body. That that's huge. That's huge when it comes to race day. It, it, can, is. it can be the difference in like, like me be the difference in having a okay race or the race of your life. Yeah. Yeah. You would have had the race of your life for sure. Yeah. And I also know you would have had the race of your life at Iceman as well if you wouldn't have gotten sick. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a that's a whole nother story. That I'll be honest with you, that kind of that broke me for a while. For as far as doing any real structured training and dieting, because I that I took that very seriously. Dropped twenty pounds over the course of four or five months. Gave up a lot of stuff to get there. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, one little illness just kind of derailed the whole thing. And it, yeah, like I said, honestly, it, it, it broke me a little bit. I'm in that boat right now of being a little broken from my race that I just had. So I, I know exactly how it feels now. <laughs> yeah, you, and you went, I think you made even more sacrifices for you, what you, the race you did out West. So yeah, totally get yeah. it, dude. What types of things, devices do you use for recovery? Anything for specific after hard workouts or races? It could um, be protein shakes. It could be oh, massage rollers, whatever. I mean, there's a lot of different things you can use. Sure. Yeah. So as, as far as like supplements, protein, whey protein with, uh, I'll usually mix some glutamine with it too, because even though your body produces that naturally, you're burning through more of it than what your body can produce. So I'll, yeah, I'll supplement with glutamine. Yeah. Some other amino acids, a good, uh, multivitamin. <clears throat> yeah, and as far as like massage, a foam roll, and then, uh, I have a little percussion massager that I'll use along with some, you know, light stretching. Yeah. Once, once in a while, yoga, need to, okay. need to get back on more yoga. 
And any supplements other than the protein? So I'll take L-arginine. I'll take quercetin. So the L-arginine is like a vasodilator. Good yep. for vascular function. Keeps all the blood vessels relaxed and flowing good and everything. And then the quercetin is a, it's just a natural anti-inflammatory. And that really helps with like, uh, so for asthmatics like myself or people with respiratory issues, even allergies, it helps kind of keep down inflammation in the uh, smooth muscle of the lungs. Also, you know, magnesium in small amounts helps with that as well. So I'll take magnesium too. Although you don't want to take too much of that stuff. Otherwise you'll end up, you know, stopping halfway, th- you know, a few times during your race to do a potty break. But um, <laughs> Because that yeah. also relaxes smooth muscle and your intestines <laughs> are made of smooth muscle. So you don't want to relax that stuff too much. We know what happens there, right? <laughs> but, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty much about it. I mean, those supplements and then, uh, yeah, the whey protein and glutamine. Is there anything that you do specifically pre-race or to get ready? Any specific meal you'll have? or I like um, like long grain rice or like mixed rice or any any type of like even like uh barley any type of long burning carbs like brown rice and all that stuff sweet potatoes beet juice i'll yep. drink i'll drink like if i know i'm going to be going into an event that i feel is important to me i'll drink beet juice like for a week before like i'll drink eight 12 ounce glass of beet juice every night and then drink a bunch of beet juice like maybe even like 24 ounces of beet juice the morning of the event whether it's in my head or not i feel like whatever is in the beet juice helps my blood flow better i don't know get you ready to rock explain that but that's probably one of my biggest is beet juice okay just just uh in case anybody's going to try it just so you don't get scared the first time you go to the bathroom after drinking a lot of beet juice, your your kidneys don't process all of it, especially if you're doing really high output exercise. You know, your in, internal organs kind of slow down a little bit and put all the blood to your muscles instead of your organs. So your kidneys aren't functioning great when you're doing high output exercise. So the first time you urinate after drinking a bunch of beet juice, it may look like you're pissing blood. <laughs> you're not. <laughs> It's just the beat right. juice. It's just the yeah, beet that juice. scared the crap out of me the first time after a race. <laughs> first time I did beet juice, I thought my kidney. I thought I blew out my kidneys or something. <laughs> what have I done to myself? Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything that you do pre-competition to get motivated? You do any visualization, any music? Visualization of yeah, what how how I think the race is going to go. Yeah, I'll play whatever, you know, whatever music is motivating me at the time, you know, my workout, you know, the top, top five songs in my workout playlist. I will think about past events that I've done. I'll think about, I'll think about Jason Potsander and the stuff that he is able to push through and has to push through. Yeah, I'll think about all that, all that stuff. Because, you know, when, when we're when we're in some of these events, as you know, sometimes it comes down to the most fit person, the most trained person. But a lot of times also it comes down to who wants it the most, right? Exactly. So who, who refuses who refuses to quit? Um, so I, I try to think about those people like Jason that motivate me in that way about there's there's a there's a poem that Jason wrote about when the pain comes it's called but that poem I like to read that poem when uh, you know when I'm preparing for a race or preparing for an event or I'll be honest with you preparing for a lot of other other things in life like it's 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 valid it's it's real it's something that's a good reminder it's a, it's a great reminder poem that basically it talks about you know when the pain comes don't hide, grin, smile, greet it as an old friend and, and, and push forward, you know? Exactly. So, 
Very nice. I like that. I also like that poem as well. I mean, I've had my fair share of races this year and last year where I've also thought of him for a little bit of pregame mental, let's go. Got to push through the pain, man. Yep. How bad yep. do you want it, right? Yep. Upcoming events on your calendar for this year. Do you have any big ones? And if you do, maybe you could tell us what they are and explain where they are and what they're what they're about. I really only have one event right now on my calendar and that is taking a priority over all the other events and I'm not sure what I'm going to do after this event but I've been preparing specifically for this event it's the uh, Lumberjack 100 in Manistee at Big M so it's a 100 mile mountain bike race on the big outer loop so three laps on the 33 mile loop out at Big M about I think it's what is it about seven to eight thousand feet of climbing, something like that, Rob. I thought it was ten. Okay, but right. I could you're, be wrong. You're scaring me even more now, All right? Ten thousand <laughs> feet of climbing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's it's a a big race. We were all gonna do this race with Jason on fat tire bikes. We had made these plans last year, last fall. He wanted to. It's a bucket list race for him, and he wanted to do this solo on the fat tire bike, um, and we were going to do it with him. Unfortunately, Jason's having a little bit of trouble recovering from some surgeries, and he's got some right side paralysis and um, some other stuff that he's dealing with, with with his cancer and chemo treatment and stuff. So he, he contacted us to ask us if anyone would be interested in doing this race with him on a tandem. and. I, I jumped on that right away. Like this guy helped me through that Everesting. I'm like, I'm going to do whatever I can to help him on this tandem. And I know, I know you were, I know all of us. I know you expressed that you would be there as well. And if, you know, you would pilot the tandem if something happened with me and I couldn't. So that's awesome, dude. Yep. Really appreciate, I'm there really appreciate too. that. So yeah, we're, we're going to, we're going to do this. Lumberjack 100 on, on the tandem with Jason. Matt from Rock and Road in Grand Haven really stepped up and is helping us out with this super badass full suspension <laughs> mountain bike. Yes. Like the thing is, it's so badass. Right on the frame, it says Conquistador of Montañas or something like that. I don't even know how to say it in Spanish, but right. basically it says Conqueror of Mountains is what it says in Spanish on I'm right on the top tube. And it is, it's a, it's a, it's a sweet bike. So it's, it's a, you know, awesome bike for us to do this on full suspension. So Jason will be as comfy as he can on the back. And yeah, so been putting in some time on that just to get used to driving it. Cause it is as great of a bike. It is as it is driving a tandem mountain bike through the woods is like trying to drive a school bus through the woods. So it's, it's a exactly. challenge. Way sure. more challenging than what I thought it would be. Is it? It is. It is. It's crazy. I actually, <laughs> I need more time on this thing, Rob. So yep. if you have any time in your schedule, yeah, and you you feel like you might want to tempt death, I appreciate <laughs> you getting on the back of this thing with me. Okay. This week. Yeah, we. we I think I'll have some time that uh, we could do that this week or even possibly this weekend. Awesome. Awesome. I mean, we can even set it up. We should actually probably set it up because we're still a couple weeks out from Lumberjack. Yep. We should set it up and have you, because you're an alternate, yeah. to drive this thing. You need, to drive it. Around. you need to drive it with me on the back too so you can get used <laughs> to it a little bit too. Yeah, I and think you're right. I tell I you, man, you're going to... You're gonna giggle. You're gonna giggle like a kid when you get on this thing. I get on this thing and I can't stop laughing because it's just so crazy. How it's just it's a wild ride, man. Oh man. Yeah. Again, thanks to to Matt down at Rock and Road, man. This it's just awesome for for him to loan this bike to us to to do this race. Very cool. That is awesome. It it I can't wait for the 18th, and I can't wait to to be all we can be on that day. Yep. And. Uh, We'll see what happens. Yep. Going to be a great day no matter what. Yep. If you were to give any advice to younger athletes that maybe look up to mountain bikers, that maybe look up to you, what would that advice be? 
I'd say bluntly and maybe not, I don't know if I'm using the best words, but what I've always told my kids, and I don't swear a lot, but when it comes to this subject, I put a little extra emphasis on it. I would say stay away from the stupid shit. And the stupid shit meaning drugs, alcohol, tobacco, none of that stuff has any place in an athlete's body. It's not going to do anything good for you, nothing but bad. Stay away from other people, other kids that are doing stupid shit because it's going to get you involved in doing that stupid shit. And that's, that's not going to lead you where you want to go. Absolutely. Um, Ground yourself with other successful kids, other successful people that have like goals, you know, similar goals, you know, surround yourself with people that are, that want to be where you want to be or surround yourself with people that are where you want to be. From my experience, that would be the best advice I could give youth coming up in sport. Absolutely. I agree with that. Stay away from the stupid shit. Yep. And don't be around people doing stupid shit. Those are, that's, I think that's perfect. Yep. Because when you get involved, it can take your life on in the wrong course and you can end up in places you don't want to be. Yep. I agree with you 100%. Yesterday, you know, the first time kind of getting on and just riding the road and looking around and I wore my mirror on my glasses. And so what I started to do on the road is I was looking at the road and seeing spots and things in the road and pretending it was single track. And I was weaving all around the road while I was paying attention. Cause if there's a car coming, you don't want to do that. Yeah. But what it also did was the cars that were coming up behind me, I would continue till they were within like 150 yards. Yeah. And then I'd, stop doing that but they were well aware of me and they gave me lots of space when they went around me so <laughs> yeah. they're probably calling the cops like hey man there's some drunk guy <laughs> right around the streets of spring lake <laughs> it's funny you say that because i really in my mind i was thinking the same thing and i was waiting for a police officer to come along and pull me over <laughs> oh that would have been funny people can find you on facebook if they want to connect and chat absolutely all right well brent uh, this has been amazing. I, I appreciate you coming on for the first ever podcast. I know we had some technical difficulties at the start and it was my fault. This was a great experience for me to dive in a little more into our crazy world of biking with you. And I appreciate you you coming on. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for, thanks for talking to me. It's good talking to you again. And I'm not letting you off the hook on that, on that tandem, dude. So I'll be, I'll be <laughs> up this week. We're going to get on that tandem. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you in the next episode. See you, brother. You have just listened to Unpacking the Athlete.